So now that we've familiarized ourselves with the idea of Gaussian processes, let's use them to derive predictive distributions that describe uh, a particular data set of interest. Now the setting is as follows. So we assume we have observed a set of input output pairs. So an xi with the corresponding fi. And we assume the following model. So we assume that our observations fi are made uh, through this observation model where we have some mapping xi to some uh, corresponding yi. So this is, let's say, a forward model. Uh, but then we also have measurement noise. And this measurement noise is going to be uh, Gaussian distributed. And we're also going to assume that we have a Gaussian process for this uh, forward model from an xi to the corresponding output, which means actually that we're not going to think of uh, the outputs being generated by a fixed function, but we say that these functions, there's some flexibility or variability among these functions that, do, that perform these mappings. So that essentially reflects uncertainty in my model. Right, because in the Bayesian regression case, we said, okay, this forward model is parameterized with a set of parameters W, and we also expect some uncertainty in these parameters W. But now we treat this on a functional level. So we immediately think, okay, this Y is some, some functional mapping from X, Y to an output domain, but these functions, they can vary a bit. So we're going to assume we have a Gaussian process for this uh, model Y. Um, meaning that this discrete set of observations is going to be characterized by a, a Gaussian distribution and we're going to model that with zero mean and the covariance matrix being uh, fully determined by uh, the, this kernel. Okay, so this is our modeling approach. We're trying to recover this uh, distributions over functions essentially. And then, so this y is a random function. So every time I observe it, it, it is a different function and there's this random noise. Um, because this is a Gaussian process and my noise is Gaussian, the sum of these things uh, will also lead to a Gaussian random variable, right? So we saw that in the video on uh, properties of, of Gaussian distributions. But it essentially means that my observations are drawn from such a normal distribution with a covariance matrix determined uh, via this, this kernel uh, function and some noise parameter uh, beta minus one. So what we've done over here, we essentially derived a non-parametric model a non-parametric model it's non-parametric because i work with gaussian processes so they generate just some functions which have some characteristics defined by this kernel but there's no true or explicit parameters used and if you compare this to the parametric model that we used before so so this was uh, the case in our Bayesian uh, linear regression example. So we have some forward model, which is explicitly, explicitly parameterized by a, uh, a variable W. And if I then also say that W is drawn from some distribution and this W could be, or this distribution could be the prior distribution or it could be a posterior distribution after I observe my data set. But once I say W is also a random variable, then actually this could be uh, formulated in this form by saying that, uh, my kernel is given by the equivalent kernel. Okay, and this conversely also tells us that this parametric approach that we had before was just a specific case of this more general uh, Gaussian process uh, approach that we currently uh, take. So in this Gaussian process uh, approach, we essentially take a possibly infinite dimensional feature space approach to uh, Bayesian uh, modeling. Okay, now let's see what it means to make predictions with Gaussian processes. So the idea is that we have a set of training points, so observations that I already made in the past of input output pairs, so this x with uh, the corresponding values for f, but now I'm going to make predictions for uh, new data points and want to see what the corresponding uh, f uh, star values are going to be. So the star indicates like new data points for which I want to test. Then the idea is as follows. So, so, so the idea is this, that my Gaussian process model these function, right? And of course there's a vari variability uh, among these functions. But the idea is that suppose I have some set of training points uh, X for which I know the corresponding uh, feature values or the, the, the function values. And now I also want to evaluate, I want to look at the, the, the function values at, at the different data points. So let's say points that I haven't observed yet. So in principle, I could consider this as evaluating the, fun evaluating the function values for both the, the x's and the x stars. So that gives me the following factorization. So this is my complete Gaussian process. 
But now I'm going to factorize this with an F and an F star, right? So I'm going to split it into, let's say, my training set and my test set. Then using the Gaussian uh, conditioning property, I can formulate these conditional uh, probabilities, right? For uh, the function values at these, let's say, unseen uh, data points, F star and X uh, star, given my original data set via the following uh, equation. So this is what we um, formulated in, in uh, the video on the properties of, of Gaussian distributions, that uh, if we can make such a factorization of my uh, multivariate Gaussian distribution, well, then we can define the conditional as follows, which have a particular mean and a particular covariance matrix. Okay, and that's interesting, right? With this Gaussian process formulation, I say that my observation of my function uh, values are obtained from such a multivariate Gaussian distribution, and I'm going to split it into a set of points that, uh, that I call my training points and a set of test points. And then I can make this conditional factorization that gives me a new Gaussian distribution. So from, from this Gaussian conditioning property, I can actually directly obtain uh, the posterior distribution for what my function value should look like given my already observed uh, training data points. So now let's consider the following uh, example, right? So we are modeling this uh, sine wave. So blue is the ground root sine wave. And then we have some observer, observed data points, uh, which are sampled from the sine wave with some noise. So they do not lie exactly on this blue points, uh, on this blue line. But these red pluses are my observed uh, data points. So these are my corresponding training points that determine this uh, big X and F uh, vector. And then this uh, dash line is given by evaluating my Gaussian process on these uh, X stars and F uh, stars. So essentially all the points that I'm going to use to make this, uh, this plot. Then with such a data splitting, so of true observed data points and now my predicted uh, points, I can see that my uh, posterior distribution has a particular mean and a covariance matrix, right? And this mean is going to determine by my original data set where uh, the mean at a particular point uh, X star is given as a combination of my, well, original data points, weighted fit this uh, inverse uh, kernel uh, operator. And it turns out that this product between the, the kernel evaluated at the stars relative to, to added axis, this takes on a high value whenever X star is close to another point in, in my gram matrix, uh, essentially. So that means that whenever our points are close to my data points, they take on a similar value. So my predictive mean is really determined by these data points. And you see that indeed the, the prediction, so the red dash line is close to my uh, true signal, so the blue line. Uh, but if I move away from the data points, uh, I can actually make uh, larger errors, right? So large error. But at the same time, and this is interesting, at the locations where I have large error, I also have large uncertainty. So we also see that the uncertainty increases when I move away from the data points. Because this uh, covariance matrix, so that essentially captures this uncertainty, it, uh, it is intrinsically large, but then I can subtract this particular term over here. And again, the product, this particular product takes on a large value whenever X star is uh, close to X. So then I would subtract a large value and that's what you see over here. Whenever I'm close to the data point, I have a low covariance, a low variance. But if I move away from it, then this particular term becomes smaller. And then I see that my covariance uh, increases actually. So, so also my uncertainty increases when I move away uh, from the data points. And this actually gives me a nice bonus for working with these probabilistic models that they allow us to identify regions of large uncertainty. And this uh, can in turn be used to uh, in inform my sampling process. So if I want to improve my model, then, yeah, then it's best to uh, gather new data points in regions where I have this large uncertainty. And this is called active learning which consists of identifying these uncertain regions of following by gathering more data for these particular uh, data points. Okay, so what I really plot over here are uh, my predictive means. So uh, these means really as a function of my test points, uh, X star, and the covariance really as a function of these X star. So the covariance was given here, plotted as a plus minus uh, three uh, standard deviations. 
But of course, I can also explicitly draw functions from this Gaussian process, right? And that's what I do over here. So this is the case when I only have one data point and then I draw the functions from this uh, posterior Gaussian process. So this, so I'm going to call this the posterior Gaussian process, right? It's, it's still a Gaussian process, but it is informed by my uh, data points and I can use it to make new predictions. And so I, when I draw functions from this posterior Gaussian process, I see that most functions, they tend to go to this uh, point quite closely, but when I move away from it, they can do whatever they want. So they become ex increasingly random in that sense. And if I have more data points, then they still all pass through these particular data points. And if I have more and more points, then they all tend to agree on the points on which uh, we sampled them. Okay, so that's to be ex expected, but it's nice to actually see this, right? And then the variation among these functions that is captured in this uncertainty or in this uh, covariance functions. So uh, now finally, um, I so we are able to construct posterior uh, distributions using these kernels, right? So that's what I talked about. But still these kernels, they are parameterized by the set of hyperparameters, right? So in a previous video, I considered this exponential kernel, which was a really flexible kernel uh, uh, to use, but it still depends on these uh, four hyperparameters. And I haven't said anything about how to choose these uh, hyperparameters, actually. You can make a reasonable choice and that can help you approximate a lot of type of functions, but actually you want to tune them to get the best out of your uh, model. So what you can do, of course, is uh, you can resort to uh, cross-validation where you want to minimize the error with respect to my uh, predictive means or what you could also do. And that's maybe what you should do because now we're in this probabilistic setting. We have that our Gaussian process is really defined by this, this matrix C, right? Uh, defined by my kernel uh, matrix, this gram matrix and the, this noise uh, parameter. And we assume that my data points were generated via such a Gaussian process actually. So what we can do, we can just fill this in. So this is a, a normal distribution for my function values f. So it assigns a probability of these particular observations. So we can just plug this in and evaluate uh, the probability of this vector being generated by such a, a Gaussian process. So I can use this form to construct a likelihood. So I'm going to choose my kernel parameters by um, maximizing the likelihood where I should know that this covariance matrix depends on my kernel parameters theta. Theta, it's all in the C. And actually it's all actually specifically in this uh, kernel function. So, and since this is a Gaussian distribution, I can take the log of it and that gives me this uh, tractable expression where these C's actually still depend on uh, my model parameters theta. And I'm going to maximize this. And of course this is uh, still a very, complicated function still, but I can numerically solve it for theta. I can do some gradient descent or whatever to, to optimize this log likelihood with respect to my model parameters. Okay, so that's all I have to say about Gaussian processes. Uh, they provide a very flexible way to derive predictive distributions in a non-parametric way by choosing a kernel that describes the Gaussian process. And now these uh, predictive distributions can be thought of as the posterior Gaussian processes where we condition our function evaluation for unseen data points on the data points in our, data, uh, in our training set. So that was captured in this particular equation, right? So this describes a general Gaussian process and now we have a set of uh, training data points and a set of unobserved or new training points for which we want to generate the, the corresponding function values. So we can condition my prediction on the existing data set by factorizing my uh, multivariate Gaussian in the following way. And that gives me this conditional distributions, which are still Gaussian distribution with a particular mean and a particular covariance matrix, which are entirely based on this uh, kernel. So in that sense, these predictive distributions are non-parametric models because they do not rely on explicit parameterization, but they are fully characterized by these uh, kernel functions.